Good morning, everyone. I am Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and I want to welcome you to today's hearing. For those of you who have been unable to find an open seat in the chamber, there will be overflow seating available downstairs with a video link. Uh, we do have an extremely important topic today. Uh, it's a busy day around City Hall, and my colleagues will be hopping in and out, I'm sure. I want to welcome uh, for their debut testimony, uh, Drs. Wu and Lawrence from the Health Department. We look forward to hearing from them uh, on our topic today, which is chronic disease. We're going to be hearing a package of 11 pieces of legislation, including three bills and eight resolutions that focus on chronic disease in New York City, including heart disease, stroke, tick-borne illness, and sickle cell disease. New York City has logged many public health victories in recent years, but significant challenges remain, including for the chronic diseases we are focusing on today, most of which have trend lines moving in the wrong direction. These diseases have something else in common. Education, awareness, and outreach are critical to their prevention, timely diagnosis, and or successful treatment. First up, we'll be looking at coronary artery disease and strokes, which are a leading cause of death in the United States and in New York City. One of the biggest underlying causes of cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure. And over the past two decades, the trend lines on this measure are moving in the wrong direction. In 1996, 22% of New Yorkers reported high blood pressure. By 2018, despite major advances in medicine along the way, that percentage had risen to 29%. High blood pressure and cardiovascular vascular disease also disproportionately affect communities of color and uninsured and underinsured individuals. And treatment is complicated by the fact that many people are unaware that they even have high blood pressure because there are usually no warning signs or symptoms. Next up, we'll be looking at sickle cell disease, an inherited blood disorder that can cause intense pain, anemia, stroke, and premature death. About 100,000 people in the United States are living with sickle cell disease, approximately 10% of which are right here in New York City, though only 2.5% of the national population lives here. Sickle cell disease disproportionately affects African Americans and Hispanic Americans. Patients with sickle cell disease often report feeling ignored or judged by medical professionals and thus can feel hesitant to seek medical attention. Research on sickle cell has been consistently underfunded and today we still do not have enough safe, effective treatment or cure for this disease. And finally, tick-borne diseases, which are also on the rise in New York City and nationally, likely due to climate change. The number of reported cases of Lyme disease in, in the United States, for example, has tripled since the late 1990s, and the location and geographic range of ticks that spread germs continues to increase. Because of this trend, the Northeast, including New York City, is now considered a high-risk region for tick-borne illnesses. These diseases often go undiagnosed and without awareness, early treatment, uh, without awareness or early treatment, there can be dangerous results, including swelling of the brain and even death. Today's bills aim to raise awareness about these chronic diseases, to increase education, encourage prevention and early intervention, and to provide resources to those in need of care. We look forward to hearing from DOHMH and from various advocates and health organizations on how we can partner together in this fight. We thank you for being here today and look forward to a robust discourse. Um, I look forward to hearing from the administration now. I think um, Dr. Yu, Dr. Wu, will you be kicking us off? All right, please. Um, we have a customary affirmation that will be administered for both of you by our committee counsel, Sarah Liss. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can begin.
Good afternoon, Chair Levine and members of the committee. I am Dr. Winfred Wu, medical officer in the Division of Prevention and Primary Care at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined today by my colleague, Dr. Cheryl Lawrence, medical director in the Office of School Health. On behalf of Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the proposed legislation, which would require the Health Department to provide a list of the organizations the department regularly consults with regarding the prevention and management of chronic diseases, place automated self-administered blood pressure machines in certain public places, and establish standardized procedures for treating students with tick bites. The mission of the health department is to protect and promote the health of all New Yorkers. A primary component of our work is therefore aimed at reducing the burden of chronic disease by addressing the underlying risk factors that lead to obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and stroke. In recent years, the health department has expanded our work specifically to address hypertension control. We engage with a variety of stakeholders to inform and improve our approaches to reducing the burden of chronic disease. These organizations include, but are not limited to, academic institutions, community-based organizations, and nonprofit organizations that aim to prevent and reduce chronic disease, or more broadly, address the social determinants of health that impact chronic diseases. I will now turn to the legislation under consideration today. Intro 643 would require the department to provide automated blood pressure machines for self-testing use in public space, such as parks. Hypertension is a leading risk factor for heart disease and stroke, two conditions that contribute to more than one in five premature deaths in the city. Making community-based blood pressure kiosks as accessible as possible is a health department priority, as they serve three main purposes. One, enhancing awareness of blood pressure among the general public. Two, serving as an engagement tool in early detection of hypertension following a high blood pressure reading, which is then confirmed by a clinician. And three, offering a free, accessible way of monitoring blood pressure between visits with a healthcare provider when other preferable methods are not available. The health department supports increasing access to blood pressure measurement, including through automated machines. One type of blood pressure machine is a kiosk. And the health department currently maintains 60 blood pressure kiosks throughout the city. This includes 55 kiosks at community pharmacies and five kiosks in partnership with other city agencies. <clears throat> community pharmacies are a strategic location for the placement of blood pressure kiosks as they offer kiosk users access to pharmacy staff who can answer questions and offer educational materials on blood pressure. Between June 2017 and June 2019, close to 200,000 readings have been reported from these kiosks with a monthly average of 7,955 readings. A 2019 field survey found that the kiosks were beneficial to users and nearly half reported using a kiosk weekly to track their blood pressure. As a result of using the kiosk machines, users indicated they intended to report their blood pressure results with their doctor and some planned on making changes to their diet and physical activity. Location information for these kiosks and other sites that offer free blood pressure checks are available online via the NYC Health Map. The NYC Health Map is promoted on agency social media channels and agency staff have previously distributed educational materials to primary care provider offices and pharmacies about the importance of getting your blood pressure checked. The department supports the council's interest in improving hypertension control efforts through the placement of blood pressure monitors in public spaces. We look forward to working with the council to discuss the best ways to reduce hypertension amongst New Yorkers. Next, in show four would require the health department to provide a list of non-governmental organizations that we routinely consult with on the prevention and management of chronic diseases. We currently work with hundreds of community partners and other organizations on many aspects of this work. We support providing this information and look forward to discussing the details of the legislation further with the council. Lastly, intro 1243 would require the health department to promulgate rules that establish a procedure for school nurses to respond if a student appears to have a suspected tick bite. As part of the standard procedure for school nurses for students presenting with health issues, in the rare occurrence that a student presents at a school nurse's office with a tick bite, 
the nurse would assess the area, provide first aid, and inform parents to refer the child to the student's medical providers for any treatment needed. This is part of an established mechanism that emphasizes the importance of seeking care from primary care providers for health issues. We are confident that school nurses are well equipped to handle any students that present with a suspected tick bite and would like to further discuss the proposed legislation with the council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu. Um, I'm pleased that we have been joined by Health Committee member, Council member Bob Holden, and uh, a very special guest, the chair of our Finance Committee, who's the lead sponsor of our resolution today related to sickle cell. And I'm going to cue him, Council member Danny Drum, to say a few words. Thank you very much, Chair Levine. Uh, for holding this hearing to give attention to, among other issues, the sickle cell related conditions that impact so many members of our communities. I will let the health professionals describe the science behind sickle cell related conditions, but what is clear is that sickle cell disease is a public health crisis. With so many individuals in New York who either have sickle cell trait or sickle cell disease, a large effort is needed to meet this issue head on and to address the myriad of concerns that arise. Recognizing the need for the state to launch a more coordinated effort to tackle this health challenge, Senator James Sanders and Assemblywoman Alicia Hyman introduced A06493 and S2281 with the goals of decreasing morbidity and overall cost, the increasing quality of life, this legislation would create demonstration programs to coordinate service delivery, provide genetic counseling, conduct community outreach, promote mental health services, and train professionals. In addition, the bills would establish a statewide coordinating center to provide resources and monitor progress. Since nearly all of the individuals impacted are of African descent, the diagnosis and treatment of sickle cell disease is a bellwether of how well our society is dealing with race-based health disparities. With top-notch medical professionals, dedicated community-based organizations, and government backing, New York is poised to address one condition that is so prevalent in communities of color and move toward closing the health care gap. I look forward to hearing the testimony of all the witnesses, but especially want to recognize the work of Dr. Tom Moulton, a dear friend and zealous advocate for individuals and their families dealing with sickle cell disease. Without him, we would not be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chair Drum, for your leadership on this issue. Um, I, I, I want to welcome you again, and uh, I, I often remark um, that I hold the city's public health, uh, city's health department in extremely high esteem. I consider it to be uh, the best big city health department in not just America, but the world. Um, and it's my first time working with all of you in this forum, but we, we welcome you here uh, to the committee. I, I, I want to understand your exact stance on the bills that are being heard today, uh, starting with intro 643, um, which uh, would require placement of blood pressure monitors in public spaces. Um, uh, to the extent that you have objections or concerns, could you articulate them? So thank you, Chair Levine, for that um, opportunity to comment. So the agency is supportive of the Council's intent through Intro 643 to increase the awareness uh, and availability of uh, blood pressure and, and opportunities to measure blood pressure uh, within the community. Uh, this, it, we, you know, we recognize this as an important strategy as part of uh, addressing the hypertension um, issue within New York City. And we look forward to speaking further with the Council uh, with respect to um, the, the bill. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by uh, our colleague, uh, Councilmember Danique Miller, who is also one of the leaders on the issue of sickle cell disease. And I want to cue him if he has an opening statement to make. Thank you, Councilmember and, and, and Chair. Uh, no, I, I just simply want to say that I want to thank my colleague, uh, Councilmember Drum, 
uh, for his resolution and the resolution which I have calling on uh, June 9th uh, to be a uh, uh, national day and, and, and bring awareness to this dreadful disease of which I myself have a trait. And, and um, it's, it's, it's just so disheartening that we have to see that we have digressed um, in, in treatment and uh, research. And because of that, um, the, the course has, has really increased and will continue to increase because of uh, people are often misdiagnosed, uh, they're not treated in, in, in the same way, and we want our health services to be done in an equitable way just as everything else. And this is a disease that is obviously disproportionately impacted in the African-American community, and we want to ensure that those resources are there. One of the other things I just want to say here, and this is a commitment that I have made and the caucus have made, and I'm hoping that our, our colleagues here, while we call on the state to do their part uh, for $5 million, certainly the city, which, which, which has 70% of the sickle cell patients in the greater New York area, um, um, should do their part as well. So certainly um, w w within HHC that there is somewhere that we can provide comprehensive sickle cell services um, as well and, and do our part as well. So I'm, I'm really excited um, about the work that is being done here in these chambers today. And I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Council Member Drum as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, Council Member. And you're absolutely right about how disproportionately New York City is impacted by this. Uh, the national figure is that 10% uh, of all the cases in the whole country are right here in the five boroughs of New York City. So we have to address this as a city and a state, and, and I thank you, both of you, for bringing this to the Council's attention today. Um, and we're going to be hearing from advocates uh, shortly to go in depth on this issue. Um, uh, but, Doctor, I just want to understand a little bit better about your stance on the high blood pressure testing. We know that many people with high blood pressure actually uh, don't know that they have this condition. It, you don't necessarily have symptoms, uh, though it can be a very severe underlying health problem that can lead to cardiovascular disease. So it's clear we have to get people tested, and we have to go to where they are to make it easy and um, convenient. And I think that's the intent behind wanting to place these devices in public settings where our folks are going. Um, why not do that? What, what's wrong with, the, with, with that strategy? So, Chair Levine, we agree that uh, it's an, an important health issue, health issue with respect to um, helping New Yorkers, New Yorkers understand um, the issues that relate to hypertension, particularly amongst those who may have hypertension and are unaware of it. Uh, the health department has um, performed uh, and, and uh, implemented various programs to raise awareness uh, amongst New Yorkers about the dangers of hypertension and the fact that it's, uh, it, you know, commonly known as this quote unquote silent killer. Um, there, there was a recent campaign called the Know Your Numbers, which encouraged New Yorkers to uh, get their blood pressure checked so that they could understand um, where their plush blood pressure stands and to, um, you know, follow up with their care providers if it was elevated. We agree that um, making available uh, increased opportunities for measurement of blood pressure uh, in the community is an important one. Uh, placing blood pressure kiosks is one of several different strategies um, to make uh, the uh, measurement in the community feasible. Um, as, as mentioned in the testimony earlier, uh, the health department supports the New York City health map uh, where New Yorkers can look to uh, identify areas in the community where they can obtain a freely uh, measured blood pressure. Uh, to date, uh, the, there are about 1,300 sites citywide uh, that New Yorkers um, can go to get their blood pressure checked in the public, and we continue to uh, seek out opportunities to promote NYC Health Map uh, through uh, direct engagement with the public, as well as detailing um, uh, amongst healthcare providers and, and other um, uh, vested stakeholders. Are, are you concerned about the cost or the logistics or some other, as, other aspect of placing kiosks in public locations? So, Chair, I mean, there, there are uh, a number of uh, logistical issues as it relates to um, placement of blood pressure kiosks. I can share with you uh, the department's uh, focus on placing uh, the 55 aforementioned kiosks uh, in the community. Uh, we had, we focused on uh, pharmacies, uh, really for three main reasons. Uh, one being that these are uh, generally um, uh, 
uh, entities within the community that are, are well trust, you know, given, um, you know, their focus on health. Uh, the second is uh, based on the fact that we understand many New Yorkers with hypertension uh, are on medication, and so pharmacies are locations in which they are very um, comfortable and routinely uh, visiting to, you know, refill medications. But I think, I think third and most important is, is that access to um, a clinical pharmacist who can really help um, individuals understand um, any readings that they get from a kiosk or from a pharmacist obtained blood pressure, help them contextualize and understand what that number means as it relates to um, you know, their health and perhaps their medical treatment. So uh, again, that is why uh, we had focused um, on placing blood pressure uh, kiosks in the community. And again, we, we view uh, making access to uh, community-based blood, blood pressure measurement um, with kiosk being just one of uh, several different approaches. Uh, uh, others include um, promoting um, individuals to uh, obtain, uh, home blood, you know, uh, obtain home blood pressure monitors uh, such that they are able to uh, measure those, uh, their blood pressures at home and, and share that information back with their healthcare providers. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by fellow health committee members, Council Member Andy Cohen and Council Member Keith Powers. Um, doctor, do you keep track of the communities with the highest incidence of hypertension, and is that where you are focusing your efforts to secure more testing? Uh, so, um, so Chairman, I mean, yes. We, in terms of the blood pressure kiosks that we did place, uh, we, we, we sought to focus on communities um, you know, where we understood the, uh, the prevalence of hypertension was greatest, and so that was, uh, you know, what informed our decision making as far as place, uh, you know, selection of pharmacies for placement. Very good. Uh, regarding intro 2043, um, which, excuse me, 1243, um, this might be a question for Dr. Lawrence, uh, which seeks to. Uh, solidify our response to rising rates of tick-borne diseases among children in our public schools. Uh, could you clarify again your stance or the administration's stance on this legislation? We'd like to continue discussions on this bill, our, considering as mentioned before that our nurses are well equipped to handle the needs of New York City kids. So this is a, we would like to be able to continue the discussion further. Okay, but uh, are you concerned that it's redundant, that it would be difficult to implement? I mean, why not secure that all nurses are, are, are well equipped and following a uniform protocol for, in testing? So thank you for that question. So school nurses work within their scope of practice and in accordance with applicable laws and regulations and guidelines. Specific authorized activities such as tick-borne uh, tick illnesses are not individually identified in applicable requirements for regulated professionals. Okay. Um, I do want to turn to some questions on sickle cell, uh, which is uh, the third major disease category that we're co covering today. You know, there's, there's a disease which disproportionately afflicts uh, the Ashkenazi Jewish community. It's called Tay-Sachs. Um, and as, as an expectant parent, I had the experience that all uh, Ashkenazi Jewish parents now have, at least in this country, of an intense battery of tests, screening, and counseling. Um, uh, when we were, my wife and I were expecting our first child um, to determine whether um, we were facing uh, Tay-Sachs uh, in, in, our, in our offspring. And there is, is, is a menu of responses that the health system is now mobilized to take uh, in such cases, including things like IVF uh, and other strategies. And these methods, uh, while a little bit scary for, for folks uh, like me and my wife, um, have served to dramatically reduce the incidence of Tay-Sachs in this country. And I'm wondering why we don't have similar mobilization of effort to take on another disease which disproportionately targets um, one group in this country, um, and that is sickle cell, which, if I have my stats right, um, is 200 times more likely 
to be found in, um, in African-American children uh, relative to white children. Um, it also um, disproportionately, although at lesser incidence, impacts uh, Hispanic American children. Um, why don't we have a similar mobilization of screening and education and early intervention so that we can win the battle against this disease? Uh, so, Chair Levine, um, you know, we recognize the, bird, the tremendous burden that uh, sickle cell disease uh, pre presents to many New Yorkers. Um, and you know, we would look forward to the opportunity to, to speak with the council further uh, on potential opportunities to, to further um, uh, many of the points that you had just articulated. I can tell you with respect to the city, uh, much of our, our programmatic work around sickle cell disease is uh, driven through New York City Health and Hospitals, or, where they have many programs uh, staffed uh, with, amongst other folks, board-certified hematologists, you know, who really are well-versed in, um, you know, the management of sickle cell disease. I, I got you. Look, it's on the hospitals once someone contracts the disease, but we're focusing here on the kind of education, the screening, the outreach that does fall into the bailiwick of the health department, right? This is a broader public health imperative that needs to take place, not just in public hospitals, but in doctor's offices everywhere, and, and even in outside of doctor's offices. What is the health department strategy for this? Uh, so, Chair Levine, uh, again, most of, the, most of the focus from the city has been through New York City Health and Hospitals. Uh, many of the programs do have uh, community engagement activities um, to, to, um, speak, that speak to many of uh, the points you had uh, raised. And, uh, but nevertheless, you know, we, um, as the health department, would look for the opportunity to speak with you and other members of the council uh, to think further about strategies to, you know, address uh, awareness and, and screening and, 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 and the like. Okay, I'm going to pause and, and ask my colleague, Councilmember Drum, um, I believe he has questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm wondering if you know how many people in New York City have sickle cell disease? Uh, so thank you for that question, Councilmember Drum. Uh, the health department itself doesn't uh, uh, have specific numbers as far as the total number of New Yorkers um, uh, who have sickle cell disease. Uh, we, you know, we look to um, data from uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which estimates one in approximately 365 African Americans um, have sickle cell disease. And so, you know, again, we recognize that, uh, you know, that uh, equates to a large number of New Yorkers who, uh, you know, are, are suffering from this condition. So you don't collect the numbers yourself then? We do not collect that data primarily, no. Okay. Um, what does DOHMH uh, do to ensure that those with sickle cell disease receive the best care? Uh, so thank you for that question, Council Member Trump. Uh, um, again, the city, the city's primary uh, response around sickle cell disease um, is, is driven through uh, New York City Health and Hospitals. Uh, there are three. Uh, programs in particular um, based out of uh, Harlem Hospital, Kings County, and Queens Hospital Center, um, where they have uh, you know, uh, programs specifically geared towards sickle cell disease, uh, which includes both you know, the diagnosis and management, but again, they also have uh, community engagement efforts um, that seek to uh, you know, work with members of the community to uh, address many of the um, issues and concerns already um, spoken to earlier. So does um, DOHMH do anything to educate the communities about sickle cell? So the city, uh, so the health department um, does not have any of those primary programs, but we would look forward to the opportunity to speak with uh, you and other members of the council on uh, ideas on how to, um, you know, further advance that messaging. Does DOHMH uh, screen newborns um, for sickle cell? So that's a good question, Councilmember Drum. The, the health department itself does not perform any primary screening uh, that is left to uh, the, the care providers, um, for which uh, the parents and you know, um, uh, you know, children and others who are uh, uh, at risk for sickle cell disease. Uh, that is uh, primarily managed uh, clinically. And are those numbers reported to you, or are they reported to CDC? So those numbers are not reported uh, to the health department and they are neither reported to the CDC. 
does DOHMH provide any type of mental health services to those dealing with sickle cell disease? So I'd have to defer, uh, defer to um, uh, colleagues at New York City Health and Hospitals, again, who you know, have a lot of the programming around sickle cell disease. Uh, my understanding is that they do you know, offer comprehensive services to address uh, you know, um, the larger needs beyond just sickle cell disease uh, you know, w within their clinics. Does DOHMH coordinate with um, uh, health and hospitals on or have discussions with um, health and hospitals about sickle cell disease? So I can, I can say that, at least from my purview under uh, the chronic diseases I work with, you know, the health department does regularly engage with uh, NYC Health and Hospitals. I can't speak specifically to um, our engagement with h and as far as um, sickle cell disease, but we would be happy to uh, follow up with you and, and the council uh, as far as, uh, you know, kind of our uh, collaboration with h and uh, on sickle cell disease. Okay, it seems like this is one area where um, a lot more really needs to be done, um, and it seems to be an area to me that has been very overlooked by DOHMH, um, and um, I, I hope that uh, that doesn't continue to be the case moving forward. Uh, so hopefully um, with this resolution and uh, with council input, we'll be able to uh, discuss this in more depth the next time with the Department of Health and maybe with Health and Hospitals as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, Councilmember Drum. And I see that we've been joined by some of the activists and leaders and, and some of the patients um, who've come to talk about the issue of sickle cell. And we look forward to hearing from you in our public testimony coming up shortly. <clears throat> and uh, I do want to thank the administration. We're going to wrap up this portion because we have another elected official who's waiting to speak. Uh, so I thank you again for your testimony this morning. And I would like to call up very special guest here, uh, Assembly Member Alicia Hindman. And uh, again, we, we, we welcome all our, our friends uh, from the advocacy community. We have a tradition here in the council that the way we show uh, gratitude or we cheer is through uh, waving our hands like this, uh, which you're free to do at any moment. And uh, folks probably know this, but if you'd like to testify, we'll ask you to a approach the sergeant and you can fill out uh, a slip to make sure that we get your name in the queue. Um, welcome, Assemblymember Hyden, Hydeman. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you, Chair Levine. It's my first time, so All right. truly well, honored. We're going to be extra nice to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but please, uh, we, we welcome your testimony. Um, well, good morning. Thank you. Um, so my name is Alicia Hyman. I'm an assembly member for the 29th Assembly District, which is in Southeast Queens. And um, I am now in my fourth year in the New York State Assembly, but I did not carry the sickle cell bill until I believe the, my second year in because the bill used to belong to Assemblymember Shelley Mayer, but she felt that it would be more apropos in the Assembly if I carry the bill. And being that I do have a daughter with sickle cell trait, um, I was quite happy to do so. I've, so I've been carrying this bill for approximately two years with State Senator James Sanders and some of the things that you highlighted in your questions to the Chronic Diseases Department of um, the New York City Department of Health is that this disease is very much overlooked. There is um, children are screened at um, when they're born, if they're born in a New York City hospital, obviously in New York State, and then that's really the end of it. There is no, um, it, is, it is pressed upon the, the advocacy groups who are in, some of them, some of whom are in this room, to really do the education and outreach to those parents who now realize they have children with sickle cell. So if you are not born in, in New York City and you come from elsewhere, you could have sickle cell but not know it until you um, go to see a, ped a pediatrician if you, if you have a pediatrician or you present crises in a hospital and then you have to go get treatment. And there was a young, um, there was a family here earlier whose daughter, um, every three months, she, I think she's less than four years old, every three months she has to, she presents um, 
crises to sickle cell, but I just really want to thank the advocacy and the resolution that's going to be passed um, that will highlight June 19th, the Sickle Cell Day in the city of New York. You have an advocate, robust community in here. We um, are really underserved. We have more states like Texas and I think Florida and California who have bigger budgets for sickle cell treatment um, and education. So that's really what we're doing. And I always say this, if there are more of us working on one accord, we can do more and push in the state to get the money. We do have a Democratic Senate now, so we are optimistic that we'll get more money in the budget. Um, my first year, we were only able to get 170,000. The second year, 200,000 in the budget. And it, some of the hospital systems that you mentioned earlier, the hospitals were where it goes to. We have to do more work. I know Dr. Moulton is in here somewhere, but one of the things we're looking at doing is making sure that we work to get money into the CBOs through the New York State uh, Department of Health to make sure that the CBOs who do most of the legwork most of the heavy lifting to get information out to families receive that. Um, the NAACP has also added this to one of their health initiatives, and they were in Albany lobbying last year. I know they'll probably do the same again this year. But this is, this is not about us, obviously. It's about constituents that we serve. And I will, I'm, I'm not a long talker, so I'm definitely going to let the advocates talk about their issues facing sickle cell. But one of the things that Chair Levine, you said about all the screenings you went through um, when your children were born because of uh, Tay-Sachs, we have to make sure that the same effort is put into a disease that predominantly affects African Americans and Latinos. Um, we had some really great testimony in Albany this year, and I really hope we'll do the same uh, next year to make sure the budget is that much more robust. So I thank you for your advocacy. I thank you for this hearing today. Um, it just goes to show me that this is not an issue that we're just tackling alone in, in the state uh, legislature, but you're tackling it here, too, in New York City. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Assemblymember, for your leadership on this and for testifying. Nothing makes a New Yorker's blood boil more than hearing that Texas is beating us. <laughs> we can't let that happen. <laughs> We're going to have to up the budget for that reason alone. Uh, on a more serious note, what, what do you suggest that we do to really improve our outreach? Well, one of the things that when you were asking um, the gentleman from DOH, one of the th is, is you hit several items, which was the, they know nothing. They don't they rely on health and hospitals. Um, health and hospitals, is, as we know, is facing severe cuts. So how are we going to, we can't just let, give them the information and expect them to carry it. They're not teaching their, their residents about this disease. They're not learning this in medical school. If they are, they're just touching on it. So we need to make sure the outreach is done. Back in the 70s, we used to, there used to be PSAs on the television about sickle cell. I remember the commercials. It's, it didn't go anywhere. It, it, instead, more and more people are affected with it. So I would say the same way you put him the task is that he, should, he has to follow up with you, and they have to give you a plan of what they're doing in New York City to um, address sickle cell and educate schools, a lot of children present crises while in school. They miss a lot of days of school. That's not fair. And a lot of teachers don't know what sickle cell is. So the education that these advocates talk about is, uh, and the Department of Health has to work in tandem to make sure that our teachers and our administrators know what sickle cell is and how it affects their students and why their students are sometimes missing class. Thank you. I'm going to pass off to Councilmember Drum for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hyman. Uh, it's good to see you here in City see Hall. You too. I have uh, seen you active in all different parts of the borough of Queens, so uh, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering um, if your legislation, I think it, it calls for uh, the opening of eight centers. Am I correct on that? It and does. is that statewide? It does, because we have to remember that we, all, we, we often neglect areas like Syracuse, Albany, Buffalo, Rochester. Um, um, and parts of Long Island have a large African-American Latino population, and a lot of those individuals, too, are affected by sickle cell. So that's why we wanted to make sure that we spread it around the state. Um, I was able to do some outreach, some um, um, interviews with advocates around the state that work on sickle cell, because it's not just a New York City issue, but obviously that's what we're addressing today. But it has to be statewide. 
And the purpose of the centers would be what? What would, it, what would they do? Well, to, to, once someone is, is, is screened and has a sickle cell, because sometimes it's not just the newborns, it's people that are coming in from other countries who are, are, present symptoms, symptoms. Once they're screened, um, the education that we know um, as far, and, and they will tell you, having a healthy diet has everything to do with um, fighting a crisis. There are sometimes there are drug trial programs that Novartis um, has been able to uh, have have some patients enter, but the important is the, the health and development of the children and adults because it's, um, I, I met a young, I'm not, I met a mother who lost her son in his 30s because he presented crises with sickle cell. So once you get to a certain age, doesn't mean you still, you still have to be active um, in your, in your, proactive in your treatment when it comes to sickle cell. So that's why it's needed around the state. So I was a little bit surprised, to be honest with you, that DOHMH is not really collecting numbers or data or statistics on any of this information that mm -hmm. we were asking them about prior. And I just am concerned also that they're uh, pushing the responsibility for it over to uh, health and hospitals. And do you know of what health and hospitals is doing on this at all? No, I don't. I know in specific hospitals are, are working more than others. So um, that bothered me also. On one of the things that when we met with Chairman Godfrey about this bill, when he, he said to, we should probably divide up the bill so we make sure that it, it, it we're not leaving any area um, we're not overlooking any area. So that was one of the things that we might have to do some tweaking with the bill. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the bottom line is to get the funding. Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't have the money, then we really can't ask any of these hospital areas to do anything as, as they're facing cuts as they do every day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman. Thank you, Councilman Drum. Thank you very much, Assemblymember. Thank I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Inez Barron and Councilmember Alika Amprey samuel um, And we're now gonna pass on to our first panel of, of public witnesses. Uh, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, did, did you want to come? Could you forgive me one moment? No problem. Okay, yes, yes, well, so, sorry. We are gonna move to the next okay. panel. Apologize for the confusion. That's okay. You're welcome back here anytime, Assembly Thank member. you very much. Thank you. And I'm gonna call up the panel and while they're making their way, I'm going to cue one of the sponsors of our legislation today, Council Member Barron. But first, let me uh, read out the names of our first panel of witnesses. They include Charlene Jacobs, Tartania Brown, Jacqueline Baker, Tom Bolton, and I apologize for not being able to read the handwriting here, Linda. Balone. So if the five of you could make your way up uh, to our front table, uh, and while you do that, uh, we're going to turn it to you, uh, our sponsor of one of the bills today, Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you to the chair, and thank you to the panels and the public that is here on these various issues. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I am the sponsor of Intro 4. Yes, that is 4. It's been a while getting here, but we're so pleased that now uh, under this leadership, it is here to be discussed. And Intro 4 is a very simple, basic bill. And what it says is that the Department of Health should coordinate and generate a list of all the organizations that are functioning in the city that are doing work on alerting people and advocating on behalf of those who have chronic diseases. And oftentimes, the organizations are doing great work, but they may not be acknowledged or known, and the work that they do may not be coordinated with other efforts that are going on. So the bill simply says that we want DOH to generate a list of all the organizations with whom they have an affiliation so that we would have a composite, comprehensive list of those groups that are working against chronic diseases. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member. And I'm going to cue now our panel. And uh, why don't we start up with you on the end, ma'am? And if you could make sure your mic's on. Oh, sorry. My name Thank is Jacqueline you. Baker. I'm a parent advocate for sickle cell disease, and I work with support the community-based organizations. I am from Northern Westchester and a retired teacher. I have two adult sons with sickle cell disease who have struggled with the disease. My youngest son. I lost his job. He was um, made it through college at an extra year, of course, as a civil engineer, but he lost the job due to the many days that he had to stay in the hospital. 
My oldest son, he had to go on a transfusion program for more than 20 years so that he can be able to um, work with sickle cell. But again, he still just got recently was sick again and hospitalized. So I'm here to say that sickle cell disease, for some reason, um, it just doesn't get the attention it deserves. It's, it's not looked up to me as a priority, and it should be. It needs to get the funding like other um, chronic illnesses get, like HIV, Parkinson's. They get a lot more money, and sickle cell disease is just really hardly a, no funding or adequate funding in order to help the patients care for themselves. As, I, as, I, as my children were in school, I had to talk to the teachers so to make sure that they can move on to the next grade when they were sick, so there was that constant communication. But it was a struggle, and I had to keep working, you know, talking to them because they didn't understand what it was. When you even go to the hospital, a lot of medical um, professions then didn't know how to treat sickle cell patients. So it was a lot you had to learn as a parent, and I did. And, and now we, you know, we see that sickle cell disease just needs the support, and it needs the funding. It can, it, a lot of things can be done better for sickle cell if they had the money. We're here, we're here fighting, with, you know, to advocate for sickle cell. We are working with the legislators. We're happy that we did have a little bit of funding, but we need a lot more to make a difference so that they can live a better life. Sickle cell patients deserve that human right, and they deserve the health care that they need so they can go on to be if they want to become a doctor or lawyer instead of staying in the hospital. With this money, it could save, it could save them from being in the hospital for long periods of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Baker, correct? Yes. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by our colleague on the Health Committee, Dr. Matthew Eugene, council member, who is also the lead sponsor of uh, a number of our uh, pieces of legislation that we are considering today. And we'll be hearing more from him shortly. Uh, and we'll pass it off to you, please. Okay. Good morning, my name is Charlene Jacobs. Um, my, I work for Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm a nurse practitioner there. Uh, I've been working there for about two years now and I've been working with patients with sickle cell disease for about four years at this time. Uh, I work with a three person group, which is a small group and we care for about nearly 400 patients, adults with sickle cell disease. And one thing I must say is that our team in general and our healthcare system is really struggling with keeping patients out of the hospital and decreasing their length of stay. Um, care um, in general for sickle cell disease is inequitable and is also um, undermined by many other um, illnesses. So for instance, as we've been mentioning before, um, HIV gets a lot more funding, though it costs less than sickle cell. So we do need uh, more resources in the hospital. We do need hospital hospitals to support sickle cell programs like our own. As um, we mentioned earlier today, we have patients who do not have um, access to us as healthcare providers, so therefore they are not getting the care that they need, and their health, um, their health and their lives are shortened because of this. Patients are living until 36 years old, which is lower than it used to be. It used to be in their 40s. Um, therefore, we, we need funding for programs to support sickle cell, support sickle cell um, community-based organizations, hospitals, um, to provide resources for patients and their families so they can live healthy, active, and productive lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I apologize that we have to use the two-minute clock. We have a very long list of people who want to speak, and we just want everyone to be heard today, uh, those who do want to testify. Um, we thank you very much, and Mr. Moulton. Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Moulton. I'm a pediatric hematologist um, working with sickle cell disease for over 30 years. Um, I want to clarify something in terms of the bills and some facts is um, New York State has 10 percent of the sickle cell population in the nation, yet in 2017 New York State spent specifically for sickle cell disease $170,000. Um, that is a 66 percent decrease in funding from the early 2000s. So despite this being a health disparity, the government has consistently whittled away um, at funding for sickle cell, inadequate as it is. 80% of the sickle cell disease patients live in the New York City area, not just New York City, New York City area. That is why the bill, well, out of the eight programs, five are in the New York City area and three are upstate. Um, in addition, um, 
patients get care not only at the tertiary hospitals that they get at community hospitals as well. So in that bill, in the, amongst those five in New York City area, two must come from community hospitals so that we can collect the data. Part of the reason for this bill is to collect data on sickle cell disease patients, which is sorely lacking. How much does it cost? Are they being cared for? Most adult patients do not get the specialized care, and that is part of the reason why there is such a disparity in terms of mortality. If you look at England, mortality is much higher um, in terms of age than it is in terms of the United States. Um, so, you know, the bill will be, it has very mu much more specifics in it, but um, there are so many complications. And it is proven that comprehensive care not only decreases the cost um, of sickle cell disease, but improves the quality of life. And with just a 3.3 percent decrease in cost per patient, New York State Medicaid could save anywhere from four to five million, which more than funds the three million that's been asked in the bill. Impeccable timing, Dr. Moulton. <laughs> you must have practiced in front of the mirror. Uh, thank you very much for your leadership on this and for speaking out today. Thank you. Please. Hi, I'm Linda Ballone, um, but the research nurse at New York City Health and Hospitals, Queens. Um, I'm here actually to talk about our program um, on sickle cell disease and uh, the progression of our program. Uh, in 2012, we had a big problem. Our readmission rate was 64%, meaning that our patients were living the majority of their life out inside of the hospital as opposed to outside of the hospital. We had to make changes, so uh, we invested, and, and I call it an investment, in a program at New York City Health and Hospitals um, where we hired a nurse practitioner and we designated a doctor to be in charge of the sickle cell program exclusively. And um, hiring these people had made changes in our ER, in our inpatient unit, in our infusion centers, and in our psychosocial services. The results of these programs, even just after two years, showed that we uh, decreased the readmission rate from 64% to 34%, which is a 45% decrease. And that actually equates to a $1.7 million savings, cost savings for our one little hospital. And so I'm here because I, I really do believe that if we invest, uh, invest again, that word investment, a little money in um, these, very, these patients to live outside of the hospital and to live a life that will actually um, be able to also have a cost savings along that line and, and that we're really not sacrificing much by doing that. If I may. Queens Hospital is a health and hospitals corporation hospital. Right. Um, uh, what would be nice is that we could spread the word of the cost savings from there to the rest of health and hospitals corporation hospitals. Yes. Okay, fair point. Thank you very much, please. Good morning, council people and fellow advocates. Oh, that's not for me. Thank so. you for your remarks. <laughs> that's not for me. Just kidding. I have it down to two minutes. Give Just it to kidding. me. Just <laughs> kidding. Good morning. My name is Dr. Tartania Brown, and both my brother and I have sickle cell anemia. So I became a physician with a, with a specialty in pain and palliative care, actually, due to the hardship that my brother and I have gone through and my desire to make a difference by being a voice at this table. My brother had multiple strokes at the age of four years old, and which took away his physical ability and his speech. Since the age of four, my brother's been wheelchair bound and he talks with a voice box. His strokes were due to sickle cell disease, which is the number one reason for strokes in children. Unfortunately, this disease causes more than just debilitating pain. It affects every organ in the body and everywhere that blood goes. So from the brain to the lungs to the heart and even the skin, all parts of the body are touched. Being a working physician, I have to care for my patients, but I also have to care for myself. I have multi-joint damage. I have liver damage. I had multiple surgeries, including one earlier this year, where they had to place a stent in my failing liver. I've had double responsibilities, not just to my brother, but to my fellow persons living with this disease. To inform people that without knowledge and support from our wonderful government, that, with, that we are dying young, 
and suffering in silence. I just turned 40. But that is considered geriatrics in the world of sickle cell. I hope, pray, to live to 60, which is the average less than less man at this point has gone down. By supporting this bill, New York State will not only be aligned with the other states, as we've stated, but we can also provide the desperately needed funds for this disease, where 10% of the nation's population live in New York State, as stated. Part of the bill's money will go to patient navigators and advocates who can help people like my brother and myself go to attend, maintain appointments. Again, I implore you to please accept this resolution in the New York State budget and approve the $3 million to go to sickle cell disease advocacy, treatment, and research. Thank you. My goodness, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for um, speaking out today and for your leadership in the face of these challenges. Um, it's really heartbreaking to hear the challenges of your family, um, but it's really inspiring the way you've turned this into a cause that you're clearly uh, a very important leader for. Um, it's been such a, a, an important panel. I, I, I want to repeat something that I had said earlier. Um, uh, as someone who's a, an Ashkenazi Jew, I'm very familiar with another disease, uh, which is Tay-Sachs, which disproportionately affects uh, Ashkenazi, people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. And um, when my wife and I had kids, we had Doctors put us through a whole battery of, of screenings and counseling uh, to prepare for the possibility that, that our, our, our offspring could have a disease. And it's very stressful to go through, but collectively uh, the efforts to combat Tay-Sachs have led to a dramatic drop in the incidence of this disease in, in America. And there's simply no excuse that we haven't done the same thing in sickle cell. There's no excuse that we haven't recreated that kind of success in ad adequately allocating resources to outreach, education, screening, and most importantly, the continuum of care, uh, not only in childhood, but into adulthood. Um, we're hoping that the resolutions that uh, council members uh, Drum and Miller have put forward today will help call attention to that. We're strongly supportive of the legislation in Albany, and I'm not sure if you're still here, but we're very grateful that Assemblymember Heidman was here in person, who's one of the lead sponsors. Um, but you certainly have my support in this fight, and we will do everything we can to make sure that resources and attention are adequately allocated to this. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. We're going to continue to hear from others, but we appreciate you very much. We have what looks like it's going to be another very good panel. Um, leading off with... Uh, uh, a young person, we're happy about that, Abigail Jean or Jean. Uh, we have Geneva Farrow. Uh, might not be reading this correctly, but Gloria Rochette. Okay, so got it. We have uh, Mary Sarah Santiago, uh, Ginger Davis. And finally, uh, I think that's Pandora Burns. We may be a chair or two short, um, but we'll, we'll make sure everyone gets to speak on this panel. Um, okay, I think we have everyone. Great. And we, we may need an extra chair. Uh. 
Okay, sorry for the uh, musical chairs, but we're happy to get everyone up at the table. And if it's okay, I would love to start off with Miss Abigail. Can you turn your mic on? Is it on? No, it's not on. Hello, I'm Abigail Jean, and I'm 10 years old. My baby sister is only two years old, and she has sickle cell disease. I've already lost count of how many times she's been in and out of the hospital. This hurts me a lot because I know that we're not the only family suffering with sickle cell disease. We need to do something to help pass and fund the sickle cell bill, which would change hundreds of families' lives for the better. We need our elected state officials, including Governor Cuomo, to increase funding for treatment and awareness. I'm so very proud of Senator Kevin S. Parker and Assembly Person Ronnie Bishot for their continued support of this bill. I now ask them to make sure that the sickle cell bill is passed and fully funded. In addition, we need to provide more financial and medical support for these families as well as increase education for our communities to learn about testing and finding resources. Thank you for your attention. Abigail, that was wonderful testimony. Um, you do better than some of my colleagues in the city council. <laughs> I hope you will run for city council one day. How old are you? 10. Okay, and what grade are you in? Okay, have you ever testified in, in the city council before? No. Okay, well, I hope you will come back. It is so important to hear your voice, and um, the words that you said are very important. We really appreciate you sharing your family's personal challenge here because it does make it real and gives a human face to this disease, and we appreciate your courage in speaking out and calling for support of this very important state legislation. So it really has an impact that you've come here today, and um, all these cameras here are gonna, are currently broadcasting live on, on the web. Uh, <laughs> so you'll have people who, will be, who have already heard your hearing today, and it's gonna be uh, on uh, the city's television station later in the week, and uh, archived online. So you're gonna go far and wide with these very, very uh, important comments. And I do thank you again uh, for speaking out. Would you mind introducing the person who's behind you? Oh, this is my nun and Rosie. <laughs> okay, we thank you, Rosie, as well. Okay, and ma'am, I'm gonna ask you on the end. Uh, it's a very tough act to follow, yes. but um, we're gonna ask you to go next. And if you can make sure that your microphone is on, there's a button there. Hello, my name is Pandora Burns. I'm a sickle cell patient at Queens Hospital Center, and I'm very grateful to the council persons uh, in pushing this bill because it is very vital. Sickle cell might not be as popular as some of the other uh, critical diseases, but it is a disease that is life-threatening that people live with day after day. Some people never really go into remission with sickle cell. You know, this is something that they live with. And so this is very vital. I think the outreach should even be not only at hospitals, but in pharmacies and institutions of education and faith-based institutions, because you'd be surprised. Even some people in the medical field are not abreast about sickle cell. And with more and more people being diagnosed now, it is very important that people have follow-up. Our hospital have a dynamic follow-up team. Our uh, practitioner, Arturo Cynthia, and the staff there, we have our own private emergency, but a lot of places don't have these things. And they can have these things if they had more financial input. It is a critical disease. And unfortunately, at the slow rate of research, it's gonna be here for a while. So we appreciate you addressing this, and we do hope this bill goes through. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Burns. Uh, and we're so sorry to hear about your personal struggles, but it means a lot to have your voice added to this debate today. Um, and we're glad that you're here. Thank you. Ma'am? Good morning. My name is Geneva Marie Farrow, healthy warrior mom. I am a sickle cell mom, advocate, and educator. 5, 10 a.m., Tylenol with codeine in the ER. Didn't kick in until 6 a.m. 7.15 a.m., Toradol. 9.15 a.m., Tylenol. 10.25 a.m., Oxycodone. 12.30 p.m., Morphine. 1.22 p.m., Toradol. 4.09 p.m., Oxycodone. 5.15 p.m. Tylenol, 5.44 p.m. Screaming in pain at five minute intervals. 6 p.m. Morphine, 6.20, finally asleep. 7 p.m. Toradol, and on and on. This was the first 24 hours of my son's last hospital stay. He was hospitalized due to a pain crisis in his feet after a trip to the beach. Dylan is five years old and only 42 pounds with sickle cell anemia SS. Prior to this hospital stay, Dylan had not visited the ER or had a hospital stay in 20 months and 29 days. Prior to his long stretch of being healthy, we were hospitalized regularly from everything including pneumonia, RSV, and the flu, until I figured out a holistic approach to treating his sickle cell. We changed his diet, and now we take a whole host, he takes a whole host of vitamins and herbal supplements to keep him out of the hospital. Tomorrow we celebrate two months since his last hospital stay. No one educated us about anything else in terms of sickle cell other than folic acid, penicillin, and hydration. More funding is needed to educate parents on alternatives to what the status quo is now. Thank you. Th th thank you very much. And um, though I know we're all very uh, enthusiastic. I just remind folks that our convention here is, is to show support by waving. And um, my goodness, hearing about the pain uh, that seems to be one of the really defining symptoms of this disease. It's uh, really, um, it's really upsetting, and I'm so sorry that you have suffered through that. Thank you. And uh, you are focusing uh, like a laser on the need to educate and, and offer outreach to people who are suffering and those who might be at risk, and, and we definitely share that priority, and um, thank you so much for speaking out. You're welcome. Okay. Please. Yes, I, I guess my turn. <laughs> good, morning, good morning, Chair Levine and fellow member of the Health Committee. My name is Gloria Rochester, and I'm the president and CEO of the Queen Sickle Cell Advocacy Network. And how this come about, in the early 70s, I have one child that was born here in the United States and came out the hospital uh, three days, um, rearing my daughter, no one indicated to me about sickle cell or either that I have the trait. So I went home with my daughter, and about the age of 18 months, I find her uh, limping, and then I took her to the doctor. They said, nothing is wrong with her. Take her home and put some compress, and everything will be okay. Later on, I find my daughter, again, is limping a couple months later, and when I took her back to the hospital, they said she have sickle cell, SS, and children like that don't pass their 20th birthday. I did not get a genetic counselor. I did not get a support group. All I was told to come back the next day to do some tests for my daughter, and I did. And right after that, I went to the library to get some books on sickle cell. And during my journey um, with my daughter, what I did, I started a journal to write everything down that I was co going through th through the journey of taking care of her. So on that, I started an organization called the Queen Sickle Cell Advocacy Network that we based in Queens, New York. 
Our mission is to empower those affected with sickle cell disease by providing them with the knowledge, skills needed to better navigate the healthcare system so they can move effectively advocates for their personal care and promote accessibility to services and meet the sickle cell community needs. We've been doing that for 40 some odd years and doing a beautiful job. And a matter of fact, we become the National Sickle Cell Disease Association here in New York because of the excellent work that we do. We are asking the City Council to support Resolution 335, and we just had um, Council Member Dan Daniel Drum which called the New York State Legislator to pass fully funded and the governor to sign the bill now known as A6493, S2281. Legislation that would establish eight demonstration programs throughout New York State and one coordinating center to improve the life and care of the sickle cell disease patient education about sickle cell, the trait, and other, uh, and other health disparities. We are also calling in to support resolution 980 through my council member, I, Danique Miller, to declare June 19 of each year Sickle Cell Awareness Day in the city of New York that we proposed to him on June, uh, in June to pass that resolution. Morbidity increased sharply, and you could see the poster that I have over there with a few from the Queen Sickle Cell Advocacy Network, the patient that have passed on. And there is just a few, but every single day we have patients all over the country that are dying, and we need to do something about that. Um, the cost of treating sickle cell disease is estimated at 1.1 billion per year. The average cost per patient per month is $2,000. Please, we are asking the city and the state to invest in these families. Sickle cell disease is a disease that needs to be taken care of. 70% of the birth is in New York State, were born in New York City, and, and nearly, thank, thank you ever so much for New York State to put in the funding for sickle cell. We're looking for $5 million in the state of New York and what the city council can adapt in their initiative coming up. Thank you ever so much for having us here to testify today. We thank you very much for speaking. We really do. Thank you. I'm a little nervous speaking in front of the council, but I'll try the best I can. I'm not much of a public speaker, but I will speak. Um, my name is Sarai Santiago. I am an outreach worker for SCTP and Sickle Cell Thalassemia Patient Network. And also I am diagnosed with sickle cell disease. Uh, my parents came here in 1984. I was born in 1987. I'm about to be 32 years old in October. But through the years, the little bit of English my parents known they, you know, when I was born, the doctors told them that I have sickle cell disease. They told me, they told my parents that I will not live long with sickle cell. And a little bit of English, my parents know, they keep educating me, go to the doctors, learn more about sickle cell, and ask my old pediatrician, Dr. One, a lot of questions. Also with school, it was difficult for me to go to school because, you know, with the sickle cell and some of the teachers are not educated. And it was hard for me to make friends and everything because of the sickle cell disease. They put me in a special education classes because of my sickle cell. They almost kicked me out of school because I missed so many days of school and absence. We don't want the same for these children. We want these children to have an education. I have two college degrees, associates and a bachelor's, and I made the dean's list 3.7 when I was in college. And with sickle cell, I could be anything that I want to be. And we asking you to please fund this because you know what? A lot of students that are going through what I'm going through need the services that they need. Thank you so much. Well, for someone who was nervous, you, you have amazing <laughs> poise. <laughs> and uh, it's really inspiring to hear about your success in academia and, and professionally against um, this challenge. I hope 
other young people learn about your story because yes, sir. it is inspiring. And thank you for speaking today. Cool. You were great. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the council, to the health committee and Chairman Levine, who happens to be my council representative. Um, this is a big, huge issue that has been silent for too long. Um, I'm sorry, my name is Ginger Davis. I'm an adult living with sickle cell beta thalassemia. Uh, it's the third most common type of sickle cell disease in prevalence. Uh, the first one being hemoglobin SS, known as sickle cell anemia, and the second one is SC disease. Um, I became an advocate at the age of eight uh, because of the stories that my mom told me about my brother Mark Anthony, who was the first of five children, a classic two of five, born with the disease, but he was not diagnosed and died from a complication that was very treatable. I got diagnosed at the age of two and was fortunate to be put into comprehensive care at Long Island College Hospital, which was torn down for its property value. So we have moved to New York Methodist Hospital, the Pres New York Presbyterian at Methodist, which has become so insanely overcrowded that people are languishing in the ER for days before they get a, a bed and sometimes are being discharged from the emergency room, never had been being admitted to the hospital. Um, we've lost our ad adult comprehensive treatment programs. When Dr. Rita Bellevue retired last year, they closed the last one, standalone program that was here in New York City. Uh, Montefiore Hospital does a great job and they have a great team that's doing things, but it's not enough. And even they had a, a national model of a day-night hospital specifically for sickle cell disease that was shut down uh, for a treatment clinic, even though they were saving Montefiore Hospital hundreds of thousands of dollars annually for having this comprehensive care. This bill that has been languishing in the state legislature, legislature since 2011 is egregious, and we need to have the Assembly and the Senate take this to the floor, vote on it, pass it, and for the governor to allocate the $3 million in the budget for 2020. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. We have uh, a question or comment now from our colleague, one of the sponsors of this legislation, Councilmember Miller. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Levine. Um, so, I want to talk about uh, education, and, and I, I'm going to give you th th this kind of shared benefit of, of, of my experience in, in having a trait and, and experience and um, what my experience was a, as an adolescent and, and, and joint pains and other things that we went through that never got identified two, two years later. And I don't want to say that I grew out of it. Hopefully that, that, that is the case. But, and, and a lot of the education that I have around sickle cell um, came from advocates, and and so, um, which is very important. Um, it, it's more important that we fully fund this, and so that our local health care providers and facilities um, are, are, f are fully serviced, and so that folks who are going to be impacted have all the tools and resources, so that it was just articulated they can have the quality of life that they deserve, that they're not misdiagnosed, that that children aren't uh, put in. Uh, situations that aren't conducive to learning uh, their growth and, and, and the quality of life that they deserve. That being said, um, is there currently a program, whether within HHC or some other hospital network here in the city, I'm focusing specifically here, that has the type of resources that we feel comfortable um, that could provide um, not just information, but the health care that, that is deserved. And if not, what would that model look like? Uh, we have the resources, and no, the programs don't exist. Uh, the newborn screening program and Wadsworth Laboratory, uh, we get our pamphlets for sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, and the various hemoglobin types from them. But for the hospitals that provide comprehensive pediatric care and do have adults in their population, you cannot go anywhere in any one of these hospitals in New York City and find a pamphlet or sickle cell disease. The resource is there, it's not being distributed, and it's not being even requested by the hospitals. Um, the 1990s was the last time we had a public, a free public trait testing program, and when that grant was lost, 
No one from HHC stepped up and said we need to continue this. And primarily for people who are migrating to New York City. Um, they're the ones who are not being tested and they're being identified when they get sick, come into hospital, and then they're tested and, and, and told that they have sickle cell disease. And still, and the various languages that the uh, information exists in is not available and distributed. So there's a lot of work. And the community organizations, we do what we can. I'm with the Sickle Cell Thalassemia Patients Network and with Fallen Angels of Sickle Cell Foundation from Rockland County, and we struggle hard uh, for just in the simplest resources like education materials and to be able to distribute that as far as we can. So if, if there was an ask for this committee, this council, mm -hmm. um, what would that be? It would be to set policy. We need policy in New York City um, that things are done in a certain way. Um, in terms of we have the school-based clinics, us being able to go to the director of um, school health education and meeting with them and being able to educate all of the nurses that are in all of the schools in the five boroughs, um, to be able for, uh, for our community-based organizations to go into the schools throughout our boroughs to educate the principal and their staff, particularly in schools that have children with sickle cell disease and other hemoglobin disorders. We need to be able to pass the education on. And most importantly, we need to get into the colleges that are teaching future doctors and nurses, therapists, um, nurse practitioners, because when we walk into the hospital and are asked by a nurse practitioner or a resident, when did you get sickle cell disease, it's infuriating. This should be basic knowledge that this is a genetically inherited disorder, and they don't know that. But what they do know is to repeat that we are drug seekers, drug addicts, uh, frequent flyers, fakers. They know those things, but they don't know what it is that they need to do to care for us when we're coming into the ER. Okay, thank you very I much. I, I obviously, that, and, and Ms. Rochester, I would certainly want to hear from you because the majority, quite a bit of my education comes from, from the Queen's Sickle Cell Network. But also, I hear stories when I talk to principals and administrators and, and, and others in schools about problem children, um, and I don't think that they are, are, are being properly, not necessarily diagnosed, but, but, but treated and given... Um, place in, 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 in an environment where, where, the, where they can learn mm -hmm. um, because they are not necessarily misdiagnosed, mm -hmm. but because they don't have the tools yes. and, and the knowledge to, to, to properly uh, um, provide an environment for them to learn in a way that they should. And, and so what I'm, what I'm seeing is that there is a, a lot of unintended consequences that, that occur by virtue of, of, of just, we don't understand this thing. Yes. And, and that's the simplest part of it. And even how we, um, the, the, the course associated is because we're not investing and we don't understand and a lack of knowledge and, and, and this unknown factor is, is causing real problems. So I, I can really appreciate, um, but again, I, I just, you know, what can we do um, beyond that, and, and, I, and I think that simply what the resolution has called for, mm -hmm. and, and um, Councilmember Drum has absolutely been on, so on top of this, uh, this committee has been on top of it, uh, but certainly we can do more, and calling on the state is fine, but we have to do more here. What can we do? Well, all of us are here, and we'll be coming into your offices, and we'll work together to see what we can really do. And, um, you know, it's time for talk is over. We need action, and we're going to be here to help you. Help us. How about that? And I believe that Councilmember Drum has a quick comment. Yeah, just a quick comment, because I know that uh, a lot of the folks that uh, were out on the steps with the uh, press conference before might not have been here. But when I did question uh, Department of Health and Mental uh, Hygiene, um, they didn't have any statistics or numbers or count uh, or whatever. They said that they rely really on health and hospitals to do it. So, you know, what I say is that I think we should, you know, work together with um, DOH, MH, and health and hospitals uh, to find out if there's any discussion going on between the two um, agencies and uh, begin that education process. My education was at the dinner, 
uh, by speaking to people most affected by it. And uh, Dr. Brown was one of those people that I had the opportunity to sit with. And, um, and that's why I, you know, said I committed at the dinner that this is, you know, we wanted to move this forward. So, yeah, we need to do that very, very much. Absolutely. And we're not going to let the Department of Health off the hook on this. They have the key role in any public health challenge where we have need community outreach, we need education, we need cl clinicians to be up to speed, we need re reporting centrally. We do this with many, many, many diseases in this city. That is the mission of the health department. And while obviously the public hospitals have a key role here, um, much of what we're talking about here has to be driven by the Department of Health, and, um, and we're gonna hold them accountable for that. Thank you to this excellent panel. We're going to move on to the next group of witnesses. Um, we have Ken Cohen, uh, Dr. Rit Bellevue, Dr. Cassandra Dobson, Jeremy Griffin, and Brendan Fay. Okay, sir, would you like to lead us off? Yes, good morning, my name is Ken Cohen. I am the Regional Director of the NAACP New York State Conference Metropolitan Council. The 14 branches of New York City, just a small portion of the 53 branches in New York State. The NAACP has taken this issue very seriously. Dr. Hazel N. Dukes has written the governor, we have walk the halls of Albany to uh, support this bill. And we ask, knowing the influence that the city council and this committee has, to support this bill as well. We have come here today in support of all the advocates to make sure that their voices are heard and that people understand how important it is to fund to fight this illness. We ask you today to throw your full support behind them in not just words, but in dollars. Thank you. Thank you, uh, succinctly and powerfully stated, and we do stand with you in this fight. Thank you. Please, ma'am. Okay. Good morning. My name is Dr. Rita Bellevue. I am a retired hematologist. And today, I am on behalf of, the, of SCAC, the Sickle Cell Advisory Consortium of New York. A, and, uh, and I am an advocate today for the resolution bill number 335 and resolution number 980. Briefly, the Sickle Cell Advisory Consortium of New York was organized by Dr. Doris Wetters 40 years ago a group of professionals, patients, family. Presently, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization for physicians, patients, social workers, health professionals, all of the community-based organizations. And we work together, you know, for, for, for something better for our patients. So what I'm going to say now, I'm going to say from my heart. I work 40 years in Terfield Medical Center, and Methodist Hospital. And what I try to do, I try to do the best I can to provide comprehensive care. And as a leader of the service, I make, I make sure that everything went well for the babies, adults, adolescents, and so on and so forth. Adult, adult uh, adolescents and adults. So, you know, I saw so many things in my 40 years uh, working with patients. I, no, I saw them graduating, I saw, the, I saw the wedding, I got the picture of the babies, but I, saw, I also got you know, news of the funerals. Sickle cell is really a very unpredictable disease. 
And very, we have very, very few places for patients in New York City, as well as also in New York State. Because as a physician and, as, and also as working with the Sickle Cell Advisory Consortium, I make sure that I know what's going on uh, in New York. And I'm going to take one second to say that I was there when we had $750,000 uh, on the budget of New York State. I was there when it became 500 And when I left four years ago, it was $250,000. Well, we cannot do anything with that. We cannot take care of the patient. And there are places in New York City, there are nothing for patients with sickle cell. So we need, we, I'm standing here in, you know, in front of you, you know, really to do, please do something for a patient with sickle cell disease. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ma'am? Good morning. Thank you for having me, the council. It is my honor just to tell you who I am. I'm a nurse with uh, sickle cell disease. I also have a doctoral degree because I had to go back to learn about this disease so that I could help what I saw in the hospital. The care that patient gets in the hospital is unbelievable because there's a lack of um, adult hematologists to care for patients. Oftentimes when a, a pediatric patient leave their hematology, they're thrust into the wild and there's no hematologist to care for them as adult. And this is about the age of 18 to 21. And so we need comprehensive centers because I have worked in a comprehensive center and I see the progression, I see the care that these patients get and it was amazing. Like, doctor, um, that, like the doctor says, they graduated, they went to school, they get educated. There was a continuity of care. Now there's a, a, a inappropriateness of care. Many doctors now are not interested in caring for patients with sickle cell disease and so we need to regroup, we need to educate doctors, nurses, and um, healthcare workers to support patients with sickle cell disease so that they can get the care that they leave, that they should get, and so that they can live a healthy quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Jeremy Griffin, and I am um, an advocate for patients with rare blood disorders. Um, I'm here as a member of the New York State Blood Disorders Coalition and also um, as the executive director of the New York City Hemophilia Chapter. Um, our organization exists to build community to improve health outcomes for people with bleeding disorders. And um, people with hemophilia, they are missing a protein in their blood that causes their blood not to clot. Um, and they end up not being, it's not like they're gonna cut and they're gonna bleed to death, but they end up having joint pain and um, bleeds internally. And those joint issues are very similar. The pain that um, they experience are very similar. Our patient population also um, sees treatment at hematologists, um, just like the sickle cell community. So I'm here as a partner. Um, we believe strongly that, um, that partnership has a power to help patients with chronic and rare conditions. And we've been very fortunate to work with the sickle cell community over the last few years. We worked with uh, Assemblywoman Latoya Joyner to pass March as Bleeding Disorders Awareness Month um, a few years ago. And then we also worked on um, Assemblywoman Pollen's Rare Disease Advisory Council bill. Very excited about the work that's being done and that's why we're here, to support what they did. Also, I'm here to share with you that partnerships matter. Um, comprehensive care is a partnership. It's multiple physicians and treatment people coming together. Since 1974, um, the hemophilia treatment centers were set up to be federally funded. It has made a huge difference for people with hemophilia to have these federally funded centers for people to go for excellence. It helped us build a community to improve health outcomes. New York State needs to do the same thing for folks with sickle cell. For since 2011, a community has been coming to New York State in pain. And what the state has done is turned its back. It is time for that to end, and it is time to bring the funding that is necessary to get the resources and awareness for sickle cell community. And uh, th thank you, Doctor. And you're confident that the, I, th I think it's a $5 million ask, is that correct? Yeah. It, that I, will have a meaningful impact? Yeah. I, I, it, the ask was $3 million. I think for next year it's going to be um, $5 million. That's correct. Well, we're raising the stakes. 
uh, and I think there's a consensus that $5 million is the target. And that's against the current level of funding of what? Currently, it's, it's, it's a paltry sum. Is that correct? I, I would have to default to someone else here that knows, but it is a paltry sum. So uh, it was only $117,000 in 2017, which is shameful. Yes. Absolutely shameful. We must do better. Yes. Thank you for the council for all the support on this. Of course. My name is Brendan Fay. I'm a New York resident, and um, I am here today uh, as an ally and an advocate for the sickle cell community because of my relationship. I'm married to Dr. Thomas Moulton. I knew nothing about sickle cell until we met. I arrived in New York City in the middle of the AIDS crisis, and I'm well aware of what advocacy and activism has achieved in raising awareness and ensuring care for people with AIDS. I'm here today angry at my city and state at the appalling lack of care for New Yorkers living with sickle cell. It is absolutely appalling and shameful that other states like North Carolina could provide 4.25 million specifically in their budget for the care of sickle cell patients, or Pennsylvania 1.26 million. California, in their most recent budget, assigned 15 million for five treatment centers. And yet New York, I hope, in the next budget, because of the advocacy from this New York City Council Chamber, will provide five million to care for the 10% of the U.S. nation's patients with sickle cell who live here in the state and 80% in the city. We can do a lot. The city can do a lot. Many of us are aware of, for instance, on the buses and, and trains where we see awareness programs. And why can't we have an awareness program in our city transport system around sickle cell? Look, the mayor's office in the city recently put out a call who should be honoring in, in New York City women who have impacted the lives of people in the city. How about honoring and telling the story of pioneer women like Dr. Doris Weathers, who just died at the age of 91? We're all in this together, you know, and um, I want to thank you, Councilmember Drum, for taking up this initiative and the committee for this historic hearing today. Thank you so much, Brandon, for your outspokenness on this issue and so many other causes of social justice. Not surprising to see you active in this fight, sure. but uh, welcome to have your voice. Thank you. Um, another incredible panel. Thank you very, very much. And we're going to continue now. I will call up Anthony Donovan, Doris Polanco, Ada Gonzalez, Marlene Smith Sotillo or Sotillo, and uh, Mo, sorry, Molino Sotillo. It's hard to read the handwriting. Does someone know who I was referring to there? Last name I think is. Okay, apologize. Couldn't read that. Why don't we start right over here? Turn on. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's a, it's a great honor to be listening to everyone today. I, uh, my name is Anthony Donovan, hospice nurse. And I just want to recall 1974, 45 years ago, working at Columbia Presbyterian and walking into a room meeting a beautiful, intelligent young man who was going through an episode of something I'd never heard of before, sickle cell. And I recall his courage today and all of your courages. I've never seen such bravery and such courage with so much pain. And uh, what was really tough for me, but nothing compared to with you all, was I couldn't do a thing for him. 
and I pleaded with the doctors in 1974 to help me help this young man with his pain. And I got a story, yes, about drug addiction. You know, we, how why we couldn't give morphine at that time. Well, uh, he survived that episode. I got to know this man, beautiful person. And uh, his next episode, he did not survive. But I'll never forget him. And, uh, and all of you who are struggling so long, it's, uh, to me, your ask is so small. $5 million, are you kidding me? So thank you very much for taking this on. Like I said, it's an honor, and I greatly respect each and every one of you. Thank you very much, and thank you for your advocacy. Hello, good morning. My name is Doris Polanco. Um, I'm a mom of two daughters, and I'm, I was diagnosed when I was about three months with sickle cell SC. When I wake up in the mornings, getting my two daughters ready for school, most of the time I wake up with pain. Sometimes I can't even do their hair because my hands are swollen and in so much pain that I have to somehow just, sometimes I even knock on my neighbor's door and just say, hey, can you please help me out? Like, I can't even move my fingers. But um, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> but um, I just want to say that when we get that pain, it feels like someone is taking a hammer and is just whacking away at your limbs. My crises are usually in my arms and legs. Um, for different people, it's different places, but I just want to say I'm tired of waking up and waking up in the middle of the night and wondering if I'm the next one to die. In the past nine months, I've lost three friends that have that, that had sickle cell, and I'm tired. I'm tired of like waking up and just, you know, I've even written letters to my two daughters just in case in the event of which I, if I pass away, you know, to explain to them the struggles that I went through trying, while trying to raise them. About three months ago, I almost lost my life. It was my most um, longest hospital stay. I was there for 42 days and there were so many complications. One of them was my bone marrow just shut down and it was not producing any blood. So the doctors had literally about 20 days to try and get it back up and running before it was too late. Um, like uh, numerous things happened throughout that hospitalization. But, um, but yeah, I almost gave up and I'm glad I didn't because my daughters need me. And I just wanna say, please, like, why is it taking so long for us to get put in the budget? Like, I feel that we don't matter to the city. You know, there's so many other states that get so much more funding and have less population of sickle cell. And New York City, which is one of the most concentrated places where sickle cell patients are, are getting what? 110,000? Like, are you kidding me? You know, like, please, just, I wish sometimes that someone would just pity us and just say, oh my God, we're gonna help you. It's been a long journey and I'm just, I'm just tired of waking up to someone else dying from this disease. So please, please, if you even, like, help us out. Please. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my name is Ada Gonzalez. And um, I'm a white Hispanic female with sickle cell disease. And I emphasize white Hispanic because in the Hispanic community, there's not a lot of information about the disease and is stigmatized as an African American disease, when in fact there's many Hispanics, many Europeans with the disease. Um, I am a member of the Sickle Cell Patient Thalassemia Network, and I run a um, social media uh, page called Sickle Cell 101 Español. And my purpose is to educate the Spanish community. I get a lot of um, requests from all over the world asking for information. And we don't have those resources. 
So the only thing I can do is give whatever information that I have received from my, the organizations here, the advocates here. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. When I was one years old, I was diagnosed at birth. I was a preemie and diagnosed at birth. I'm 54. And when I was born um, a year later, I needed emergency splenectomy surgery because my spleen stopped working. And since then, I've had multiple blood transfusions. I've had multiple pneumonias, multiple bone infarcts. I've had um, gallbladder dis uh, surgery. I've had um, two hip replacements. Uh, every milestone in my life, my parents were told I would not live to see that milestone. I almost died three times when I was one, when I was 20, and most recently now in April. Um, I've been very fortunate, and I call myself fortunate because unfortunately, hydroxyurea, which is the only drug that really helps people now, does not work for everybody. But I was part of the studies in, back in 1990, and it works for me. So I went from being sick every three weeks in the hospital from being sick every three years. But still, you get sick and you still have complications. So we need funding so that we can help the providers, we can help the hospitals, um, give us the care that we need. And to help the advocates, to help families, for those who are not as fortunate as I am, to be able to move around, to have care, to have somebody go to their homes and, and buy their food. Like she said, sometimes she's so sick she can't take care of her children, to help her with things like that. And we don't have the fundings for that. We don't even have fundings for research. We're very blessed for those of us that this one drug helped, but a lot of them here, this drug does not help. Mm -hmm. So we need something so that, we need research so that we can find the one specific drug that can help all of us not just one person, or oh, I'm sorry, not just some people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gonzalez, and um, your, your perseverance is, is truly awe-inspiring. And we're, we're happy that you're here today to share your very important perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Good morning. Thanks to the Health Committee for having us here this morning. My name is Merlene smith Sotio, and I am the president for the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corp International. I am originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I came here with two children that had sickle cell, my son and my daughter. That picture described my son that passed away. Now, it's been a major struggle taking care of children with sickle cell and having two children with sickle cell, I can tell you, I had endless sleepless nights. But my love for my kids, and for education, and for information keeps me going forward every day. I am thankful that we are able to meet here again today. I've been running from state to state to try to get information and to get the help and to get whatever needed to come to New York to see if they could implement some of the changes or some of the things that's happening in other states that can be implemented here, that we would have better treatment for our patients and for our children with sickle cell. When my son got, he, had, he died at 30 years old. He had that one crisis. He never had a crisis in his life before that time he passed away. That was his very first crisis. I took him to the hospital, and the doctor telling me he does not have sickle cell. He has no symptoms of sickle cell. When, did he, um, when did he inherit this? Sickle cell is something that you are born with. And if you don't understand what is wrong with someone, how are you going to be able to treat them? And they kept him there, apparently they didn't quite understand what to do for him, and I lost my son. My daughter still struggles every day. You know, 
the, there's no funding for the things that we need. There's no, you cannot do the electrophoresis testing because there's no funding. The patients, when you get to a certain age and you're not under your parents, you don't have anywhere to go to get the funding or to get the um, care that you need. You go to the hospital and you have to wait, like seems forever, to get care. And this, these things shouldn't be. I mean, we have to go through this for too long to get care for our families. It is heartbreaking. And I don't mean to, um, to be critical, but it's about time that something is done to help us. We're suffering here. I have the sickle cell trait. I'm in and out of hospital at times with pain. My, my kidneys, my heart, my eyes. I mean, we, we definitely have to do something. And I mean, I implore you guys to, you know, take the time to invest in us because we really do deserve it. Thank you so much for your time. It's a, a happy, sad day for me today, just being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Ms. Smith. Uh, your pain is um, really palpable, and we feel it. We share your pain uh, for your loss. Uh, it must take a lot of strength to come here and speak out. Uh, I can't imagine what it took even to come here today, but it's so important that you did because we need to hear your story and the story of your wonderful son and your other child so that we don't allow this state to forget them and the thousands of others who are suffering here. So thank you again for your strength, and uh, you really are an inspiration. It's, a, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Good morning, good morning. My name is Molino Sotelo. I am the Vice President of the Sticker Solo Awareness Foundation, also the other half of the, the President, and we do share this young man that we lost in, in common. Um, 11 years ago, this organization started. And within that time, while you were saying this morning that it takes the courage to come here, it's 11 years that we have been running back and forth and trying in Jamaica, Queens, with all the other organizations to try to put this on foot today. Another thing I would like to say, I would like to applaud and acknowledge Dr. Bellevue here this morning, Dr. Moulton, and all the other people here who is part of the sickle cell organizations that is here together this morning in support of these bills. We need funding. Sickle cell need funding. And at this point in time, still there are providers who don't understand the pain of sickle cell. They still don't understand because recently, where I am still employed at the hospital, we had a patient there that would remain for over 45 minutes in pain, and they don't understand what pain is with sickle cell. There are providers who still believe that pain with sickle cell is 1 to 10. 1 to 10 with pain with sickle cell doesn't make it, it doesn't work. So here we are, we're here this morning. We are proud that everyone is here this morning who is in the fight. We are glad that you would be able to acknowledge everyone here today and see what we are pushing for. We have been back and forth with the legislators over the years to try to get funding to provide more for sickle cell patients. They are dying, we are losing them, and nothing is being done. So we're here this morning, one more time, asking and beseeching you guys, try and help the sickle cell community that they can at least live a better life. While they are still living a little longer, we would still ask that they go further in life. They would like to provide because when patients who have sickle cell in the community, it's on everybody. It's on the community, it's on the family, it's on neighbors and everyone in the community. So we ask you this morning, please help us push it forward. Dr. Moulton is here, we have Ginger here, we have Dr. Bellevue here, and all the other folks that are here this morning. We would like you again, once more, reach out to us. We are running for the past 11 years, and we still intend to keep running. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, thank you. And, and again, the deepest sympathies for your loss and, and admiration for your strength in speaking out. It's, um, it, it's important to know that we have leaders like you and your wife to uh, serve as resources and a source of knowledge for the council as we work on this. Um, I'm very happy that we've connected with you and all of the great advocates in the room today. 
And I thank uh, this outstanding panel. And we do have one uh, additional uh, final panel. Uh, thank you again. Um, and I'll call up their names. It's Gary Rissman, Epiphany Samuels, and Nadine Baker. And I, I know it might feel like the, uh, the dais is a little bit sparse up here, but all this testimony is being filmed. It's being broadcast currently on the council's webpage. That video is going to be archived. And everything that you're saying today is going to be transcribed. And the transcripts will be available online as well. So your statements really uh, will be uh, seen and read far and wide. It really does have an impact. And we're very glad that you've been part of this hearing today. And it looks like we have uh, just two final uh, witnesses. Um, would, would you be uh, uh, Ms. Samuels, is that right? Okay, and then the other one is Ms. Baker? Yes. Okay, you want to kick us off, Ms. Baker? Sure. My name and if you can turn your microphone on, there's a light. Oh. Okay. My name is Nadine Baker. I am the aunt of two young men who have sickle cell anemia. I am also the sister of Jacqueline Davis, who is also an advocate. And um, I just want to say that this bill needs to be, sickle cell anemia needs the funding that will be able to, that will help. Sickle cell patients live a quality, live a quality life. When you think about all the other diseases in this country that get millions and millions of dollars, like cancer, like diabetes, Lou Gehrig's disease, I mean, the, the, the list goes on, and sickle cell is all the way down at the bottom when so many people are affected by it, particularly, and it is true, African Americans and Hispanics, and there are also other groups in there, but that is the group that it mainly affects. And I can't help but ask the obvious, if millions of white people were dying from this disease, something would be done. This is one of the richest, most powerful, well, it is the richest, most powerful country in, on this planet. New York City is one of the richest cities. Well, it, New York City may be the richest city in, um, in America, okay? And, and in the world. And it just doesn't make sense with all the money that passes through this city, okay, all the money and the resources that are here for everything else, that it can't be here for people who suffer from sickle cell. And it really is a disgrace. And it's also insulting. And like I said, I can't ignore the obvious. When you think about who, who, what groups of people sickle cell affects, all lives matter. All lives matter. And the lack of funding, what message is that sending? That people with sickle cell, their lives don't? Something's really got to be done about that. And I said, and, and again, one of the richest countries in this world, richest city in this world, that is unacceptable. And I hope that something will be done about it. Well, th thank and, you, Ms. And, Baker. And, and um, as I think we mentioned earlier, this, this horrible disease is, is approximately 200 times more likely to strike uh, a person of African descent versus right. a person of European descent. And so it's just simply disgraceful that we haven't given this disease the adequate resources, the attention, the research, the education and outreach that's needed. It's, it's indefensible. And uh, the sad reality is you're right. If this yeah, were a disease it, that affected yeah. millions of white people, it would have been funded a long time ago. A long time ago. It pains ago. me to say that. And, and it's it really sad. does. And, and I really do feel that it affects, it makes um, African American and Hispanic people who have the disease, I think that makes them feel ashamed by the lack of awareness, by the lack of care, by no, the lack no, of funding for treatment. No patient and I should it be. It would make absolutely. them a lot more proactive for their own cause, my nephews included. 
The only, the only ones who should be ashamed are the ones who are not funding this adequately. Yes. Not the patients. Thank you, Ms. Baker. And um, our final witness uh, is uh, Epiphany Samuels. Samuels, please. Hello, thank you for having me here. My name is Epiphany Samuels, and I have sickle cell SS, and I am a sickle cell advocate and an adult with sickle cell. Um, where do I start? <laughs> uh, I want, I want to ask you all to please invest mm -hmm. in my life and yes. thousands of oh, others' lives I, mm -hmm, and thousands of other lives by passing this bill. Uh, I am 28 years old today. Um, well, not today. Oh, thank God. But <laughs> I am 28 years old, um, and I am living today with sickle cell. Thank God. But um, my brother, who had sickle cell, wasn't as fortunate. When I was 15, he was 16, and he got sickle cell complications. Um, and due to lack of knowledge and he was sent home in a hospital uh, after not even being hospitalized and then returned back to the hospital and died a couple of days after that. Um, because of sickle cell, I am more susceptible for gaining other diseases and illnesses, so I also have rheumatoid arthritis. I also have lupus, scoliosis, brain aneurysms. Uh, there's a longer list, asthma, and with being an adult with sickle cell and not having the funding, I am losing my, I am losing my team of doctors to go, for them to go to other mm -hmm. doctor, you know, for them to go to other hospitals to go take care of people with other diseases that have funding. And there should be no reason why I'm mm -hmm. not getting treated uh, because doctors don't want to stay where there is no money. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just ask you all to, yep. to invest in our lives. Um, in your life. In my life. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yes. What a powerful note to end on. You are amazing. This has been such uh, an extraordinary hearing today. Uh, I want to thank everyone who came out to testify uh, to have this on the record is going to do a lot to elevate this disease uh, here at the city council um, and, and statewide. And this was an important step in the process. We um, hopefully will move soon to vote on the resolutions in support of the, re of, of the legislation that's been spoken about today and then to have a full vote in the city council. So this is the first step in the, in the process but an important one, and I thank you all, and this concludes our hearing. Okay, thank you. It's all right, we gotta stop the bullshit, okay?